Namaste. Well, I have some interesting news. We've been going through the Mandukya Upanishad, which is really the highest scripture of any scripture I've ever studied, and I've studied so many of them. And also gotten the benefit of understanding and practicing it. The uh, Mandukya Upanishad is really about the meaning of Aum. And the meaning of Aum is exactly the four by four matrix that we've been uh, talking about for so long. If you've been following this channel, you should understand all this. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going over it yet again. <laughs> but if you haven't understood it, it's probably because of what I call fixed ideas. Now let me read a quote, a question, a doubt that the translator of this edition put before his guru. He said, The follower of every religion thinks that his faith, his scripture, or his interpretation of it reveals the highest truth, and that they are therefore superior to other faiths, scriptures, or interpretations. This notion has contributed much to the misfortunes of mankind in this world. Lastly, as regards truth itself, everyone, even a fool, thinks that what he knows is the truth. And of course, the joke that's hidden in this is that knowledge is never the truth. The truth is only what is. And what is should be obvious to even the most casual observer, but because of our religious biases, we can't see it. Let me read you the response, the answer to this doubt that was given by the guru. What you say may be true with regard to mere religion, mysticism, theology, or scholasticism mistaken for philosophy. It may be so with the early or intermediate stages of philosophy itself. But Vedanta, particularly its philosophy, sets before itself the object of finding a truth free from all dispute and not opposed to any school of thought or religion or interpretation of scriptures. Its truth is independent of sect, creed, color, race, sex, and belief. And it aims as what is equally good for all beings. The statements in single quotes are quotes from the shlokas of Mandukya Upanishad itself. And in the Mukya Upanishad, it is stated that the teaching of the Mandukya Upanishad is as good as the teachings of all Upanishads and Vedanta combined. And if you just understand this one book and realize it, you will have gained the highest gain, the greatest benefit of Vedic thought. Now, I'm not going to go back and restate everything that we taught in this series. You can go watch the series itself. If you didn't get it, if you don't have the highest truth and the highest benefit, if you feel anything is missing, go back and see what you missed. 
or better, download the book from the link in the video description and study it yourself. That's what we did. Now, the thing is, anytime you say Upanishad, Veda, or Vedanta, you're in the realm of religion. And the problem with religion was given in the first quote, the doubt of the translator, that why should I translate this if it's going to be mistaken for some sectarian creed, some uh, limited doctrine that applies only to a member of some cult or sect? And actually, this is a very legitimate doubt. We have the same doubt. And we've seen in our efforts to present this knowledge that people don't come, they don't appreciate, they don't understand simply because this teaching is couched in the language of religion. So because we actually want to uh, meet the purpose and accomplish the aims of the second part of the quote, that this is a teaching that does not conflict with any other teaching. It doesn't disagree or argue with any religious or sectarian views. It's for everybody without distinction. We feel that means it has to come out from the limited domain of religion, which unfortunately, due to the rampant atheism in society, has become a very proscribed domain. And it has to come out into the open marketplace of ideas under a new name, in new clothing, as it were, and certainly in new language, language that does not reflect religious culture, but in, in, in a language that is understandable by anybody, even very secular persons, even anti-religious persons. Because many of the very intelligent people today have been uh, deceived, really, by atheism and have become atheists without even really understanding why. And of course, from our point of view, uh, this is suicidal. <laughs> but it's also understandable because there's been so much cheating in religion. Well, I'll tell you, one of the reasons why I decided to move to Sri Lanka and make Sri Lanka my headquarters is just the endemic pervasive cheating in Indian society. It's a real social problem, and it extends to the people who are ostensibly teaching religion, Vedic religion included. That there's so much cheating and so much making the truth into a business, people are rightly disgusted with it. I don't blame them. I don't blame them for rejecting so-called religion that's really just a business. And that is, unfortunately, by far the most majority of all the religious, so-called religious groups out there. In fact, even the idea that a religion should be structured as a group as a hierarchical society is really against the very idea of religion that all are equal. Because as soon as you have a group, you have a hierarchy. And as soon as you have a hierarchy, it means that some people are more important than others. And this is wrong. So some time ago, I decided that when I had reached a point where I felt satisfied with my own personal self-realization, 
that I would create a new way of teaching these same truths and helping people come to reach these same realizations that is free from any limitation whatsoever, at least as far as possible. And in today's social environment, that means coming out from the environment and the social and cultural milieu of religion out into the general marketplace of ideas and to present these ideas in such a way that does not conflict or exclude anyone or any other teaching. And of course, to do that, we have to give up the trappings of religion, like Aum, unfortunately, until people get used to the idea that what this is really about is consciousness. That is the teaching embedded in the sound Aum. The four states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, sleeping, and the fourth, Turiya, transcendental consciousness, unconditioned consciousness. Because when one realizes unconditioned consciousness, one becomes free from suffering automatically. So happiness should be the goal, the aim. And consciousness should be the method or the means to reach that aim. And so after the first of the year, we are going to release a new approach a new methodology, a new name, a name that we can define as anything we want. And of course, the way we're going to define it is in tune with the Mandukya Upanishad. But we won't mention Upanishads. We won't mention Aum, at least not in the beginning. Only after people have understood the principle that happiness is based on consciousness. And unless your consciousness changes, you can't have happiness even if you get everything you want. <laughs> Maybe especially if you get everything you want. I went to a seminar one time and uh, the presenter said, watch out. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you get what you want because it's going to shatter all your dreams. Because you're going to find out that what you want doesn't make you happy. Getting what you want is a trap. It's a deception. It's a major disappointment. Because when you get what you want, you have to realize, oh, this doesn't make me really happy, or it may, makes me happy only for a short time. Then it wears off. So we are offering a path, a method, to get real happiness, which means permanent, unchanging happiness that is not subject to the whims and conditions of the material world. And that is going to be our big new campaign, rebranding the site and recasting the teachings after the beginning of the year. So we're going to need people to give us feedback, to give us, to help us with beta testing this whole approach. You're welcome to contact me if you want to help us with our beta testing program. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.